All right, I'd like to welcome you to the second session of the Remote Teaching and Learning Analytics web series uh, hosted by the Office of Empowering Teaching and Excellence and the Center for Student Analytics. So my name is Braden Ross. I'm a data scientist at the Center for Student Analytics and uh, I joined the team in January of this year. Prior to that, I was the head data scientist for the Center of Online Teaching and Learning at Southern Utah University. So if you'd like to see any of my past work or reach out to me and connect on LinkedIn, uh, those are the links there below. So real quick before we get started, just in case you're not aware, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Center for Student Analytics and what we do. So uh, I'd like to go through our mission statement because I think that defines us pretty well. We work to guide the optimization of student-facing programs, services, and coursework, facilitate collaborative use of data across university organizations, and we like to foster a culture of intentional decision-making. We operate under the direction of Dr. Mitch Culver. He is the head of the Center for Student Analytics, so uh, we work really hard to facilitate a collaborative uh, work ethic with faculty and so that's our goal with this webinar series as well. So uh, this is the second session like I mentioned of this web series. So the first session was uh, presented this morning by Dr. Mitch Culver. He presented on the low effort high impact teaching strategies and you can check his webinar out if you haven't already at a link that I'll share later on in the presentation. And uh, the future sessions that we have for this webinar. Uh, the only one that we have announced is the promptness and grading session and then there will be future sessions announced later on. So we'll make you aware of those as they're uh, more set in stone. But today uh, I really would love to talk about uh, the importance of feedback in the online classroom. This morning uh, Dr. Culver's presentation focused on the unique environment that we face uh, in the online learning space and the nuances that can be brought with that. And I'd like to, again, like I mentioned, focus on just one aspect, and that is the feedback that can be left in the online learning space and how it can benefit instructors and students. So first, like I said, this is a very unique situation. Behind me, you see a blank wall I'm in my apartment right now. That's due to social distancing and not the nice background and setup you're probably used to seeing for webinars that we produce, but uh, really what that tells me right now in the current education environment is that faculty are more important now than ever. Um, you know, Dr. Culver mentioned in his presentation that he gets really upset when faculty have the attitude that what they do is, you know, the best that they can do and they don't really have that much of an impact on students or, you know, their practices really don't change uh, student experience for the most part, but that's not true then and it's not true now. I think that especially with a lack of face-to-face -face contact with their peers and with administrators and with friends, students are going to be looking to instructors now more than ever, like I said. So feedback overall is going to be incredibly important for student morale and improvement in their coursework. Like I said, without that face-to-face -face contact, you know, there's no ability to stay back after class and ask questions like they normally would or stop in at your office hours. Uh, their main point of contact with someone on campus or, you know, whether you're still working there or not is going to be through the online space. Just to reiterate that, uh, the quote at the bottom is from a couple of authors that published a paper in 2007 related to student feedback. It says, the feedback that students receive within their coursework is one of the most important and powerful influences on their learning process. So again, just incredibly more important now than ever for us to be conscious of what types of things students need to hear and how they need to hear them. So let's just sit back and define feedback really quick. There was a uh, author at Southern Illinois University in 1983 named Arkelgood Ram Prasad, and he has been extensively quoted with his definition of feedback. He says, feedback is information about the gap between the actual level and the reference level of a system parameter, which is used to alter the gap in some way. So there was a, 
Another author that expanded upon his definition named Roy Sadler in 1986, because as you can tell, that first read through kind of seems more like a computer science definition of something rather than a best practices in education definition. It was a little difficult for me to read through at first as well. So Sadler says on Ronald Persaud's definition that information is considered as feedback only when it is used to alter the gap. Now the gap that they're both talking about is the gap between what a student knows and what a student does not know. And so Sadler further expands upon this by saying that the comment must be usable by the student. So I think that uh, some instructors get into the routine of feedback is just something that I do and it's something that I leave on an assignment and I don't really think too much about it. And we'll see that there's a huge difference in feedback with versus without purpose. And so that's what Sadler is referring to there. The comment must be usable by the student for them to bridge that gap between point A and point B. So just one last quote here for you by Chickering and Gamson in the 1980s. They've published extensive research on feedback, and I'm sure you're aware of them if you've done any uh, studying on the subject. But they state that in classes, student need, students need frequent opportunities to perform and receive suggestions for improvement. Knowing what you know and don't know focuses learning. Students need appropriate feedback on performance to benefit from courses. So again, they're circling back to Ram Prasad's definition by detailing that point of what you know and what you don't know. And the key difference in this quote from the prior ones is that they state frequent opportunities need to be had for students to perform and receive suggestions for improvement. So that frequency is going to be something that we're going to expand on a little bit in our analysis section, and we'll see just how important and uh, difference maker that can be. So finally, uh, there was a paper published a little bit more recently in 2017 by two authors, Flock and Garcia, and they focused on the characteristics of feedback in the online learning space. So obviously we're presented as faculty members and staff and employees in higher education with all these great tools and learning management systems to better expand our uh, tool belt, if you will, uh, for feedback, for instruction. There's any number of applications of, that these great tools have. And Flock and Garcia state that there are four essentials of good feedback. And you see frequent, specific, timely, and we'll talk about those in our analysis section and what insights we gained relating to those things, but I really want to quickly discuss balanced feedback. So again, like I said, we have lots of tools available to us and those tools give us the opportunity to provide feedback in different mediums, whether it be audio, textual, or video. And that's incredibly important and powerful to realize that, you know, not just one feedback method is available to us, we have multiple. So we'll talk a little bit more later on about you know which are best to use, when and where, why, and different things related to that. So like I said, today I really want to talk to you about positive feedback and just what kind of analysis we've done to show that there is a difference and there's a huge impact on students learning depending on the tonality of the feedback that you leave. We've talked about the structure and how it should be delivered, but I think the third prong to that fork is tonality. So we used sentiment analysis to analyze the tonality. Now, what is sentiment analysis? So I come from a machine learning background. I've done a lot of work in the machine learning field. And sentiment analysis is this subgroup of a field in machine learning called natural language processing. And you've experienced natural language processing in your daily life. So anytime you talk to a digital assistant, whether it be Siri or Amazon or Google Home, I think it is, uh, anytime you're speaking to those devices and they speak back to you, that's using natural language processing. And sentiment analysis is the field of natural language processing that analyzes the tonality and the feelings behind words. So if I say the word, to, the word good to you, you don't even have to think about it, but your brain perceives it as having a positive connotation. So 
you know, you think good, okay, that's positive. And awful, vice versa, is negative. Now, data scientists and researchers have painstakingly uh, associated each word um, in the Greater English Dictionary, and they're expanding now to some other languages as well, uh, a sentiment score. So good might have a 0.5, a positive 0.5, and awful might have a negative 0.5. And those sentiment scores can range anywhere from negative one to one. So you have all these words with different scores and all these, you know, phrases that can be strung together. And sentiment analysis looks at those phrases and the values associated with each word and makes a programmatic analysis of the overall sentiment of that statement. And so this is really great. I mean, it's a hugely incredible um, advancement that we've made in the field of machine learning to be able to do this and we can analyze those words and phrases programmatically so that gives us the opportunity to gather insights from sentences text bodies books any number of options that you want to think of and we can gather those sentiments from those pieces of text in our case the interactions that are being had through feedback so what did we do exactly now in our LMS, which is Canvas, uh, we analyzed the submission comments that were left on individual assignments. And Canvas is really great about making that data accessible and available, easy to read and use for us. So we appreciate that. And the majority of feedback was left through the L um, through submission comments in the LMS in our case. So uh, there were outlier cases where feedback was being left through conversation messages or a different medium entirely, but for the majority, it was through the submission comment mechanism. So now that we have that in mind, there were two things that we wanted to examine in our analysis, not just the sentiment of those feedback comments, but the frequency at which they were being left as well. So we have those two questions in mind, and we wanted to explore the effects of those two questions relating to student perception of quality. So I'll call it SPCQ from now on because it's a little bit easier, but that basically is referring to how a student perceives a course and the instruction given in it. So we used idea scores as a proxy for SPCQ. Now, IDEA is a company that provides end of semester surveys to students for them to evaluate the instruction, the content, and everything else within a course that they've received. So they end up with, you know, a bunch of questions and IDEA will take those surveys and generate lots of different metrics around them. And they also generate one final score that can range anywhere from one to five. So uh, that's what we used is that one to five score. Five obviously being glowing reviews, students felt like they received content well, and then one being, you know, there's a problem. And because those surveys are distributed semester by semester, we examine the data semester by semester as well or multiple years. So we phrase that, hopefully you have a sense of where we're coming from, what data we have. But what I want to do before I show you the results of our analysis is I'd like to show you a real example of how sentiment analysis works. So at the top here, you have a real world comment that was left on an assignment for a student by an instructor. And we're going to look at why it's, it's received the sentiment score that it has. So you see phrases used in there like well done, strong analysis. And as you peruse through that comment, there's not really any, you know, negative words. There's nothing that's kind of accusatory or derogative, anything that's relating to anything negative. And it's obviously a very well-structured comment. It's pointing out specific things in the assignment that they did well, uh, discussing connections. So this is a great comment and what we love to see from our instructors. And it received a sentiment score overall of about 0.33. So centered more towards that positive range. Now underneath that is a less positive comment. So this was a comment left on an assignment by an instructor. And it looks like the student maybe didn't do as well on this assignment. And so you see phrases in there like weak chapter summaries, late at least, um, 
and these are things that, you know, at least maybe you might think, well, that doesn't necessarily mean negative, but the great thing about sentiment analysis is it has the ability to determine within the context of a statement that that's negative in that case. And you see it's reflected in the sentiment score that it was assigned, which is itself negative. So obviously, you know, there's a big difference between the two comments. So that's what sentiment analysis looks like with real text and how it goes through and assigns scores to it. So this was the data that we had, and it was a lot of data. It was very computationally intensive to analyze, so it took a long time to run. And what we came up with were some results that we're really excited about. So let's talk about those. Now, here we have the, the kind of cumulative graph that came out of this analysis. So what does it tell us? And you can look at it and you can see that interactions per student is on the x-axis and the y-axis shows the average idea score for each course. And each dot you see is an individual course in a semester. So the final piece to that graph is the color scale. And that shows you the scale of the positive to the negative interaction. So on average, what types of what tonalities of interactions are occurring within each course so the majority are red which is great because that means that overall for the most part these courses are having positively themed interactions which is what we want to see you know it would be really bad if most of these were black and that would be a, an even bigger problem but you know most of the dots are red and what you might not be able to quite make out because some of the red dots are covering them, but you see the black dots littered throughout the scatter plot. Most of the black dots are actually centered towards the lower left quadrant of that graph. And what that tells us is that we can infer that negatively themed interactions and kind of non-frequent interactions really lead to those low survey scores. So students perceive those courses to be lesser quality instruction than maybe some other courses, even with low frequency, if they're being positively themed, the students perceive those to be higher quality. And there are outlier cases as with any analysis, but we tested that with a regression to determine whether or not that effect was actually significant, which it was. So that was incredibly powerful to realize. Now, the second insight we gathered from this analysis was that black line that you see through the graph. So that's a best fit line showing the relationship between the frequency of interaction and the idea score. And what you see there is it's parabolic, meaning it's got a peak somewhere. And you can see that it's right around about 15 interactions per student which we found to be the case using regression. And regression also told us that this relationship was statistically significant. So for every interaction per student increase, there was about a 0.01 point increase for the idea score, which that's incredible. So instructors who are asking questions like, how do I increase my survey scores? You know, we've shown that there's a statistically significant relationship between these two variables. So you know, we can give them a suggestion to say, hey, maybe it might be time to interact a little bit more frequently with your students and giving them feedback. So that was incredibly powerful for us to realize and really put a lot of pieces together for us in this analysis. And finally, the last insight that I wanna talk about that we gained, and I think to me is the most important one, is that when we started to examine the individual department level data, you obviously see some of those black dots in the upper left hand quadrant, meaning they're having, you know, good survey scores and some of them even have good interaction levels. Like you see, uh, oh, excuse me, you see this one right here with almost 10 interactions per student. So, I mean, they're doing pretty well. They're in that upper echelon group. But what we started to notice was that courses that were having really high frequency of interaction with their students, if they were negatively themed interactions, those courses actually had the lowest idea sur survey scores out of the entire department. Even if there were other courses in the department that had, you know, very minimal frequency of interaction, but positively themed interaction. 
So what that told us is that we can infer quantity doesn't make up for lack of positivity and in interaction, which is huge because, you know, instructors who are frequently interacting with their students and they're, you know, utilizing these analyses and saying, well, why aren't my scores going up? Why were they no different? Why were they maybe even worse? Well, we can maybe infer then that you need to be interacting a little bit more positively with your students. You need to be changing the tone of those feedback comments. So those three overall things really painted an interesting picture for us. So what does that look like in practice? Because, you know, you still need to make sure as a faculty member and as an instructor that you are sharing why students miss points and that you're communicating to those students, hey, this is why this is not going to be scored as 100 or, you know, you need to give them constructive feedback. So let's take the example from before and look at what might change if we're taking a more positive centered approach. So we got that comment, like I said from before, weak chapter summaries, late and no concluding paragraph, but at least you got some points. Maybe not the best comment to leave. And the, there is an obvious you know, problem here with the assignment. The student didn't turn it in on time. And you know, they missed a whole portion of the assignment as well with the paragraph. So how do we communicate that to them but still maintain a positive sentiment so that they can perceive it as a positive interaction? You see at the bottom there is an example of what could have been. And I want you to look at the different parts of this sentence. So the first part is you submitted this assignment late, so there will be points taken off for that, as well as the missing conclusion. There's no negatively themed language in there. So, you know, it's, it's still communicating with that student that the assignment was late, so there will be points taken off, and there was a missing conclusion paragraph. So, but again, there's no negatively themed words in there. So we're not, you know, making the student feel badly that they, you know, maybe they will still feel bad that they didn't do that part of the assignment, but we're not kind of berating them. And then that second part of the statement says, I know that you're capable of better chapter summaries. Keep it up. I know you can do it. And that positive spin on it really lifts that sentiment score considerably. I mean, it received a 0.29, and that's almost as positive as that first comment that we looked at with a 0.33. So an almost 0.4 shift in sentiment score, which on a scale of negative 1 to 1, that's huge. And so it's just keeping in mind, how can I change this comment or make it sound a bit more positive? That very simple kind of frame of reference makes a huge difference. And if you've watched Dr. Mitch Culver's uh, session before this one, you'll remember he wanted to focus on low effort, high impact insights. And that's really going to be the theme of this webinar series and why we're so excited about sharing it is because these are things that you can do as an instructor that don't have to change the very you know, fiber of your teaching practice. These are very minute changes that can make a huge difference later on with effects that you may not have realized before. So keep that in mind and just realize that it's very easy to still convey that information and put a positive spin on things. So really a good way to think about that and something that we use in the Center for Student Analytics extensively is something called the plus delta approach. And what the plus delta approach does is anytime we do a you know project for a stakeholder or have a meeting with a, a group of stakeholders or you know discuss venturing on a on a project, we sit down after or even during and ask ourselves two questions what went well and what could be improved or changed. Notice it's not the plus minus approach. And again, it's changing that tonality in your brain to say, you know, minus kind of tells us, well, there was something that went wrong and something that we did poorly. Well, why that, while that might be the case, asking yourself what could be improved or changed completely switches kind of your perspective on how you reflect on that project. So the same can be said for submission comments versus you know taking an approach of plus minus well here's what you did right on the assignment and here's what you did wrong i would almost encourage you as instructors to say 
here's what went well on the assignment and here's what you could have improved on. Because right there, improved has a positive value associated with it and you're increasing the sentiment score of that statement immediately. So just keep that in mind. The plus delta approach is a great way to look at submission comments. And I think that the stakeholders that we've talked about and discussed this with, I mean, for my experience, it's worked very well for them. So the three main insights I really want you to take away from this analysis are that negative equals negative, positive equals positive, and finally, you know, like I said, I think it's the most important. Sentiment is key. Quantity of feedback does not make up for a negatively toned feedback. So again, you can be interacting with students as much as is humanly possible, pestering them with feedback, leaving multiple comments on each assignment. If it's not positively themed, it's not going to have those increased effects that we've noticed in our analysis. So it's incredibly important to keep in mind. So I like to add the tagline whenever I'm talking to instructors about this subject, what you say matters. And I think that, you know, again, like Dr. Culver stated in his session, instructors really don't give themselves enough credit. And I think that that's unfortunate, but sometimes they need a little reminder that they're incredibly key in the student education experience in more ways than I think most of us realize. So again, we're looking at something that, you know, happens throughout the semester on a daily basis with assignment submissions that has lasting impacts on students' views of a course. So that's incredible. And instructors really, I hope, understand that they're having that impact. They're having that, you know, interaction with the student and that's what's creating that lasting vision for that student of that course. So you know, you guys are the most important point of interactions for your students during this period. And we thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for all that you do, you know, during times of crisis like this and during times of peace, if you will. So it's incredibly important to keep in mind also that this practice is going to be key for this time, but I would almost argue it would be just as important during times when we're not going through a, an abrupt change to online only like this. And I also think that something that will last through this time period is keeping in mind consistent reflection and realignment. Um, like I said, we always try and identify areas that we could have improved when we're doing projects in the Center for Student Analytics. And I think that this same principle applies here with this insight. You know, each group and department or course, any situation that you might be in as an instructor could differ in behavior than maybe what we've suggested here. The relationships might remain the same, but I think that, you know, the level of interaction, the or the frequency of interaction, excuse me, the, um, the medium in which it's delivered through, those types of things might differ depending on your situation. So utilizing um, yeah, I mean, this study is meant to recommend, not to define. I think that's a key thing to say here, is that this is not the, the Bible and you shouldn't take it around like, well, 15 interactions per student, all of them positively themed, you know, all these different things. I'm going to go buy the book. I think it's important to keep in mind that situationally, it's going to change for everybody. So taking that plus delta approach in hand again, by asking yourself throughout a semester at the end of every semester, what went well this semester with my feedback and what could be improved or changed? So, you know, asking yourself those two questions and it might be a difference in, I'm gonna leave feedback through a different medium next time because I think students didn't receive textual feedback this semester as well. Or, you know, I actually think that interacting with students uh, 20 times per student might be best for me because of the amount of assignments that I do. Anything like that, is going to continue to shape and improve your approach to leaving feedback, and it's not gonna be a one size fits all. So I would encourage you to do that on a semester by semester basis, because the earlier that you kind of identify those practices and why they apply well to your situation, the, the more you're gonna be able to improve that experience and the faster you're gonna be able to improve that experience for students. So because we're not, in a traditional setting and I'm not doing this webinar live, we don't have the opportunity for 
uh, live Q&A as much as I wish that we did. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to just pose a couple questions that I think you might be having if you're watching this webinar, as well as present you the opportunity to submit questions that you might have or um, discuss things that you might want to go a bit more in depth with. Uh, I'll include my contact information in just a minute, and you can send those questions to me. Uh, and if I think that some of those questions might be pertinent for the group to hear, the next time we meet together, I will address those at the beginning of the session. Uh, but obviously, I'll respond personally to the rest of them as well. So the first question that I am sure most of you are having is, how am I supposed to give students feedback if they submitted extremely poor work on an assignment? So I was a TA for two years, and I was fortunate enough to be a TA in my subject, which, you know, so it was a coding class, and it was a pretty advanced one. And I was, uh, I, I had those moments that I'm sure you've all had where I was scratching my head at things that I had to grade that were submitted. Um, you know, just sometimes students took complete disregard for uh, the purpose of the assignment. Some students really didn't even try, and I could tell. Um, and so it was difficult for me to, to think, how can I leave feedback on this? But to me, the thing that I learned and what I've gained from this study as well is that constructive feedback is always possible. So even if a student submits work that you, again, just scratch your head at, I think that taking that approach of thinking, well, you know, even though this is something that infuriates me, I am going to try as best I can to leave something that reflects positively for this student. Even if it's saying, I really feel like you missed the point of this assignment. I want to let you know that I'm here for you if you want to come see me during my office hours. See, obviously that puts a positive spin on an assignment that otherwise would have looked incredibly negative for a student. Um, office hours, maybe uh, you say, here's my Zoom link right now. But whatever the case, I think constructive feedback should always be possible. And again, we've seen the lasting impacts of what that can do for students and you know what that can impact later on. The second question is what medium is best to use for feedback? So obviously this study was done only on textual analysis, um, obviously because you know if we were to analyze audio or video, those are the kinds of things that Google and Facebook are doing with entire data science teams. So our resources were just a little bit limited, you know, maybe next year. But um, so most experts agree that the best medium for feedback is a mixture of all three um, between audio, textual, and video. However, they also say that it's best to just ask. Um, you can get an answer very quickly if you just ask your students what type of feedback do you feel like is best? And again, it's situational as well. I think uh, a lot of instructors are probably aware of what types of things best suit their course material. I remember for me, I was in a quantitative methods class that was very mathematically intense, and my instructor on the assignments would leave feedback with videos of him writing problems on a whiteboard. So that was incredibly helpful for me because it it saved me the trouble of having to try and navigate through him writing a textual comment of saying, well, if you leave Y hat here and you don't make sure that you're including the beta zero, but you obviously see how that can fall apart really quickly. So again, just ask, that's the fastest way to get a good response and use that plus delta approach. It might change semester to, to semester. Finally, the last question I'll I'll pose here is what if I don't have anything to say on an assignment for feedback? So some assignments might be very routine. It could be just a, a quick um, uh, assignment to get an idea of where a student's at with the material or, you know, a quiz or, you know, something that really is not like an essay where you'd be writing very contextual feedback uh, relating to what the student's done. What we found actually in a further analysis that we did with this project was that the length of submission comment actually didn't matter. So it had zero impact on the relationship between idea scores and submission comments. And what that means is that a, a submission comment that was, you know, a, a whole paragraph long didn't have any greater impact on those variables than a submission comment that was one, two, or three words long. And so what that means is 
If you don't have anything to say on an assignment for feedback, you should leave something positive even if it doesn't seem pertinent. So even if it's just a quiz submission or a very simple, you know, math assignment or a, you know, whether it's a draft of a paper, whatever it is, it's so important to realize that you submitting just good job will have the same impact that a comment detailing all the different things in an essay that a student submitted is. So just keep that in mind. You can say good job, you can say great job, you can say well done. It will have that impact. And really it has that impact for that student with the positive tone because, you know, they could be out doing whatever they may do and they look at their phone and see, oh, they left a comment that says good job on my assignment. That makes me feel good. So has that same impact and really that's what we want to cultivate is that positive tone for students. So that's all about, that's about all I have time for today. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen to this webinar and to join us for this series. I'm excited about sharing further insights with you in the future. I think we've got some great content and stuff that will definitely be uh, relevant during this time period and things that we hope help you as instructors because again, we appreciate the work you do so much. Again, I want to offer up the opportunity to send questions and comments or even just discuss different things to uh, my contact information. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn or you can reach out to me directly by email and I'll answer personally any questions about this webinar or, you know, if I think it's pertinent for the group to hear, I'll address those at the beginning of next session. And then lastly, uh, any and all resources you want to look at regarding this series uh, we'll have on that website in the red text uh, usu.edu slash AIS slash analytics slash remote learning and we'll have uh, Dr. Mitch Culver's session he posted this morning on there as well as this one and all future webinars so I appreciate the time that you've taken again uh, thank you we'll look forward to seeing you next time stay safe